It's a great pleasure. And it's rare I can say this, but I think I'm the youngest think tank here because we're barely three years old. Um, oh, oh, sorry, I thought it was... No, no, no. You're younger than me. So I'm beaten even on that score. <laughs> Outcompeted at every level. <laughs> I find it reassuring, actually. At least it's by people I like. <laughs> so, um, thank you. Um, the, I, was, I, I was sort of debating the various ways to kind of talk about what's happened. And I, the only way I can do it authentically is tell you why I decided to set up a think tank in the first place. And that's because many years ago, um, when I was a theologian, I was a university lecturer in theology, history of theology, history of philosophy for 10 years. It always struck me that Alexander the Great wasn't that great. Here's a man who conquered nearly most of the world, and his sole historical legacy is a few Greek-speaking towns by the Black Sea for a bit. It's remarkable. And, and that question, you know, everything in our society is about the hyper-individual. You know, everything's sub-Nietzschean. You know, we all need, you know, the Ubermensch, you know, and that's really kind of the goal of human activity, which I never believed. And then I thought, well, if anyone's it, it's Alexander. And he made no difference to the ancient world. And, and he made no difference. Why? Because he didn't create an institution. The most radical, the most transformative thing you can do is create an institution. And I think that, I mean, I think what the colleague said earlier is completely right. Time is speeding up. Empires that would have lasted maybe three centuries or four centuries are now lasting barely 50 years. Everything uh, historically in globalization, which has always been with us really, um, is it itself getting faster. And so I think the interesting thing is, is I was sitting in my country sort of around 2007, 2008, thinking everything's wrong, like all kind of idealists do, everything's wrong. How can I make a difference? And what's exciting, or what's why this time is uniquely propitious, is that we are in a time when all of the grand macro narratives, whether you're left wing or right wing, are failed or are failing and have collapsed. Almost no dominant or prior dominant discourse has any real legitimacy anymore. This is unprecedented. I mean, just post, post Second World War, we've largely been governed by the left, I think, uh, even if it was often through the right, from 45 to the early 70s. And then, uh, especially in the Anglo-Saxon Anglo world, we've been governed largely by the right, from, there was an interregnum, and then Thatcher Reagan up until the collapse of Lehman Brothers. But it's not intellectually possible to defend either approach now, quite simply because the whole raison d'etre of the left was to save the poor from their lot, and they manifestly failed, despite creating a whole state architecture to do exactly that. And the raison d'etre of the right was we'll create a tide or, or that will lift all boats and create mass prosperity, and they've manifestly failed in that. So we're in macro failure. And, and then the question is, is if you're in the middle of, of that sort of situation, how do you innovate? How do you make an intervention? Small, minor moves won't do because they're not sufficient to the task, as, you know, as Andrew was saying, and also they're not big enough. And the intervention I made um, really was a, as a conceptual and philosophical one. And everyone always told me studying philosophy was the worst career decision I've ever made. And, and largely, my 10 years as a university lecturer taught me that was true. Um, but actually, it was the best decision I ever made because I was actually intellectually able, I'm not saying anyone agrees with it, by the way, don't worry, I'm not claiming that, but, but at least intellectually able to offer a coherent narrative of what's gone wrong, a coherent narrative of the collapse and why the collapse is, yeah, pertains to both left and right. So my intervention was an idea, simple idea, which I called Red Tory, or which is the idea that there's a radical conservatism that does more for the poor than socialism ever did, and that also, at the same time, is a critique of the type of neoliberalism that has, in part, led us to this disaster. So all my, it's very rare for an intellectual to be able to make a difference. And so to make the difference with an idea, and a paradoxical one, inserted into the political discourse was remarkable. So having done that, I thought, well, gosh, you know, most intellectuals just fade. It's, it kind of goes with the territory. I thought the most important thing to do is found an institution 
that can carry forward the idea, can embody the idea, and can come up with specific policy solutions that over time create a policy architecture for a new settlement. And that's, that's what I did. And that's what I hope to, you know, to continue to do. And so, so for me, the, the inspiration or the hope began in an idea, which most people discount, and ended in an institution. Who, because only an institution can continue that idea and you hopefully attract good people, you make lots of mistakes, but you, you create an institution that at the macro level delivers new macro ideas. Now what's interesting is, is my, the ideas I've had have gone international at the highest level. So that, and what I often do is I don't consult or do work at the micro level. What I do is often talk to kind of politicians uh, and parties about the new broad brush strokes, the new ideas, the new ammunition, if you will, for politics. It's about the ideas that people get. Because you only win in politics with big ideas. You don't win in politics with small ideas. You've got to win with big ideas. And that's precisely because everything else has collapsed. That's the type of innovation we try to do, which is create a kind of a, great, a new grand narrative, and then to have specific policy examples that be, build that up. So to move from the macro to the micro, and to go to the question of what we need for growth, well, it goes without saying that I think we need a fundamental paradigm shift, a fundamental change, and I completely agree about the remarks about the state. One of the graphs that I found that was most remarkable is if you do uh, an account of how many American households rely on welfare in order to get by, it's crept up from just around a quarter in the 1970s to over 50% now. And what that means is essentially when the middle classes get hold of welfare, you just can't get rid of it. As Andrew uh, has, has been arguing for magnificently, pension tax reform is one of the most corrupt forms of middle class welfare that we have in our country, uh, costs some 28 billion um, a year, and 300,000 people get a quarter of all of that. So what we then have is the welfare state stops helping the poor and becomes a form of capture by the middle classes. And so if we want to create growth, we've got to totally change that. We've got to remove, we've got to stop thinking universality as the idea that everybody must get the same. Because actually, universality is the idea that everybody must get the same. is isn't a friend of equality. It's actually the reason why we have inequality. Let me just give you one idea. One of the great mysteries in British social policy is why men and women's uh, wages kind of rise, why the inequality grows. And that's essentially because the type of 1960s liberalism that we had said essentially men were, like, were just like women were just like men, and all they needed was equal rights, just like men, and equity would result. But actually, they missed out something. Women have children. And the fundamental cause for wage disparity in England is that women have children, they leave the workforce, they want to look after their children, they can't return to it, and there's no way to do so. And actually, men and female and male wages are at parity to about age 30. So if you want equality, you have to treat people differently. You have to treat women differently than men if you want equity between men and women. This is the fundamental insight we need for a new state settlement. Inequality of treatment is the only way to get equity of outcome. And what that means is we can no longer have universality of services delivering the same things to people regardless of whether it helps them or makes a difference to them. We have to have personal specific services that speaks to their needs. That's one fundamental change of the state that in my view would save billions. The second thing is, is we've got to fundamentally rethink welfare. I don't believe in wealth redistribution because wealth redistribution can never really catch up with the origin of wealth. I want to create a capital effects state, not a wealth distribution state. I want to give those who have very, very little and are therefore reliant on the public sector a capital effect from taking over the state themselves, from creating a civil state so we argued at ResPublica, and I argued for powers of budgetary challenge, community rights to challenge, to take over the state on the behalf of small groups of citizens. And that has gone through, that has become law. And what that now offers is an opportunity for people to be capitalized by the state. Instead of recapitalizing the banks, let's recapitalize the poor. 
and create asset effects for the poor. And this, this leads me on to the next stage of the analysis. Is I don't, we just want a new state. There's also something deeply corrupt in our market model, and there's covert and corrupt relationships between the state and the market. Let me just give you one example. In Britain, from 1900 to 1970, the state underwrote banking assets to the tune of 50% of GDP. From the 1970s to now, that rose tenfold, and currently the British state underwrites banking assets to the tune of five times GDP. That type of covert state subsidy prices out the real economy and prices in the rentier state that we've created. And the market state that we've created, with this whole rhetoric of neoliberalism, hasn't produced mass prosperity. It's produced massive concentration of wealth. Let me give you another figure. In 1974, the top 1% of US households had just under 9% of US GDP. By 2007, the top 1% of US households had 23.5% of US GDP. And what we've seen is the market mechanisms we've, we've followed have allowed a tiny minority at the top to capture wealth, innovation, and access to markets. And even our market-based philosophy is so illiterate that many of its advocates don't even read Adam Smith, and they can't even imagine a, public, a, a, a private sector creating a monopoly or an oligopoly. And that's what we've created. And the market models that now exist in, our, in many European countries, I think, fit the definition of a rentier economy and a rentier state. And what we need is a new consumer and competitive model to break open the market and allow people who, who own something to trade. And they're the two moves, I think. A meta move against market capture by vested interest and a complete rethink of the state that the ma new macro thinking can create a new economic settlement and social settlement that will deliver growth. Thank you.